I'd like to just read a couple quotes to you from End of Faith. Our technical advances in the art of war have finally rendered our religious differences and hence our religious beliefs antithetical to our survival. We're fast approaching a time when the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction will be a trivial undertaking. While it, and these are from three different, three different quotes. Mm -hmm. While it's never been difficult to meet your maker in 50 years, it will simply be too easy to drag everyone else along to meet him with you. So we have this force multiplying spread of ideas, this proliferation of lone wolf attacks. We know what weaponry does. What weapons were you thinking about when you wrote that? When you said in 50 years, it will be simply too easy to drag everyone else. Were you thinking of bioweapons, yeah. synthetic biology? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, nuclear is harder to do. Yeah, although it's not that hard, actually. I mean, that, it was hard to invent the technology. The Manhattan Project was hard. It's not hard to render much of Los Angeles uninhabitable for 10,000 years. It's far less hard yeah. once it was invented, but still you need the resources of a, a nation state to create the weapon, right? Well, you actually don't. I mean, you can actually, if you're willing to die, you can be the weapon. And what you need is the enriched uranium or the plutonium, but you could literally, you wouldn't get the, the, the full yield you, you would want if you want to kill the maximum number of people, but you could take two, like, like you know, 50 pound plates of enriched uranium and just put one on the floor and slam the other one on top of it, and it would go critical. You would not get a hydrogen bomb experience. Yes, but you would get, and you would be it would just be kind of like the ultimate dirty bomb experience, right? So you could you could actually be the bomb. But a, a much more reasonable thing to do if you're in this business is to just do something that's analogous to the bomb design of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where you have a gun style. Uh, apparatus where you're shooting uh, one piece of enriched uranium or plutonium into the other, mm -hmm. right? And just slam, essentially slamming them together harder than you could physically. And again, that the yield there is not, it's not as complete as, you know, a, a nation state would produce, but still you could get a, a multi-kiloton yield. And the, uh, there, the technical issue is just getting the getting fuel, the stuff you know? which does exist yeah and so so yes you do not need to, the the tools of a nation state you just need a, a few engineers and machinists you know it's powered i believe simply by ordinary explosives to get the things slamming together and i mean there are a bunch of scenarios that have been described to everyone's horror online where you can do this in a shipping container and you you know you truck it into the dc and it can be activated with a, a cell phone and William Perry has a terrifying bit of animation that he put online that just shows you how simple and and how totally destabilizing it would be to our society to do this. So just ima imagine you you build a simple device, which is just, again, just like Hiroshima, you know, mm -hmm. like a 15 kiloton explosion. If you put that, you know, right next to the Capitol building, right, you just it's like now you have a continuity of government problem. You know, who who did you kill? You killed all the senators and congressmen and, and the president. And the Supreme uh, Court and the yeah, great right. chiefs and yeah. Imagine doing it in one American city, right? And then announcing, whether this is true or not, who knows, but then announcing you have similar bombs placed in... 10 other American cities. Which and, you will not identify now. Yeah, and yeah. you will do them, you'll, you'll, you'll do, you know, one a week um, until your demands are met, right? How do we how do we begin to respond to that, right? Now, this is a, an act of terrorism, obviously orders of magnitude beyond September 11th, which ushered in a decade of just derangement, you know, and cost trillions of, of dollars uh, in the aftermath, you know, at, at least two wars and, you know, financial crises. And so imagine just, uh, imagine this happening in one city. This is within the technical capacity of a group like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. You don't, it just, you just need to get the fuel. And we have almost no way to prevent it. I mean, we don't, we're not screening things at right. our ports so assiduously as to know this couldn't possibly get in. Do you worry about bioweapons as well? Yeah, you just have to imagine weaponizing something akin to the the spanish flu which you know killed f something like 50 million people in in, in 1918 yeah the, the, the sky is the limit there you could get something that is as easily transmissible and is even more deadly when you're talking about a bioweapon the worst possible case is something that is easily transmissible 
and it doesn't make you floridly ill for long enough for long you to do, as, yeah, yeah, do yeah. as much damage as you possibly can. You right? sneeze a lot yes. on lots of grapes, yeah, on a, lots of people. For a good long time good before long you time. die. Yes. Yeah, and then those people are sneezing on grapes and people, and then nobody knows there's an outbreak until there's a million infectees or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, something like Ebola doesn't have going for it, you know, as bad as it is, as, as horrible as it is. One of the th reasons why it's not scarier is it is very quickly obvious how sick people are. If you're talking about airborne transmission of something that has you know very high mortality and a long incubation period, yeah, weaponize that. That's that is a civilization canceling event if we don't don't have our and act for together. now george church may be the only person who can do it but in 25 years with biology following what's sometimes called the carlson curve which is even steeper than the moore's law curve who knows when 10 people then 100 then a thousand people so i'd like to close on something yeah. that i wrestle with a lot you gave a great ted talk on the risk of super AI. I won't make you uh, replay it here because people can access it. I'll just pull two quotes from it to just set the context. You described the, the scenario of a super AI having better things to do with our planet and our perhaps our atoms than let us continue to have them as being uh, terrifying and likely to occur. And also saying it's very difficult to see how they won't destroy us. And I don't think that those are shrill or irrational statements personally. I also don't think it's shrill or irrational to think that what George Church alone can do today will be the province of many millions of lab techs, probably in our lifetimes. Yeah, yeah. And with those two forces out there, I don't know what scares me more. And I think about proliferating, democratizing, existentially destructive technology, just about the only thing I can think of that might protect us against such a thing would be an incredibly benign super AI yeah. that has functional omniscience because of its, its ubiquity in the networks and has functional omnipotence because of its mastery of, who knows, nanotechnology or something else. But boy, we're both scared about a super AI. It's almost like super AI can't live with them, can't live without them. Yeah. How do we navigate those twin perils? And do we need to perhaps embrace a super AI as a protective mechanism for democratized, super destructive power? Yeah, well, I do think it really isn't a choice. I think we, we will develop the most intelligent machines we can build unless something terrible happens to prevent us doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. So the only reason why we wouldn't build- the civilization a, a, gets thrown yeah. violently backwards. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. so, you know, George Church uh, loses his mind or one of his techs uh, does, and we have some pathogen that renders us incapable of keeping our um, progress going on the technology front. And you, you just have to imagine how bad that would have to be in order to actually stop the march of progress. Technology. Yes. Yeah. You know, we would, you'd have to have a world where no one understood how to build a computer again and no one ever understood how to build a yeah. computer again going forward. So from that beyond point. canical for Leibowitz type of right, destructiveness. Right. Yeah. So if it's not that bad, we will keep making progress. Yeah. And you don't need Moore's Law. You just need some increment of progress to continue. You need the time, yeah, yeah at yeah. some rate, yeah. And at some point we will find ourselves in the presence of machines that are smarter than we are because I don't think there's anything magical about the wetware we have in our heads as far as information processing. So the moment you admit that this can be, that, that what we call a mind can be implemented on another platform, and there's every reason to admit that scientifically now. And, and I leave questions of consciousness aside. I don't know that consciousness comes along for the ride necessarily if you get intelligent machines. And, and ironically, the most horrible vision is one of building super intelligent unconscious machines. Because in the presence of consciousness, at least you could argue, well, it, if they wipe us out, well, at the very least, we will have built something more important than we are. Right. We will have built gods. We will yeah. have built minds that can take more pleasure in the beauty of the universe than we can. Who knows how good it is? the universe could be inhabited in by their mind, hands. Yeah, in their yeah. hands, right? Yeah. But if the lights aren't on, if, we, if we've built just mere mechanism that is incredibly powerful, that can be goal-directed, but for whom there is nothing that it's like to be directed toward yeah. those goals, uh, well, that, that really strikes me as the worst case scenario. 
because then the lights go out if we, if we go out. So, so it sounds like you believe that the super AI is inevitable unless something the, the other equally terrible happens. happens. Yes. So our best shot of surviving is to do all we can to make sure the super AI that one day inevitably arises is benign. Yeah, is aligned with our interests. Intelligence is is the best thing we have, really. It's, it's, it's our most valuable resource, right? So it, it is either the source of or the safeguard for everything we care about, right? And there's overwhelming economic incentives for yeah, you, thousands you get immediately of rich. intensely the, the, the mo- yeah. smart people, intensely well capitalized companies to go screaming down that path. Yeah. So all of yeah. the incentives are aligned to get into the end zone as quickly as possible. And that is not the alignment we need to get into the end zone as safely as possible. Mm. And it will always be easier to build the recklessly unsafe version than it will be to take the further step of figuring out how to make this thing safe. Yeah. So um, I mean, th- that's what worries me, but, but I, I think it, it is inevitable in some form. And again, I'm not making predictions that, that we're gonna have this in 10 years mm-hmm. or 20 years, but I just think at some point, and again, and, and, and the human level bit is a bit of a mirage because I think the moment we have something human level, it is superhuman. You yeah. know, it's, it's oh, not it blows gonna, past that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a mirage. Yeah. And, and people are imagining somehow that that's a stopping point. It will barely get there and then we'll stay there for a long time. It, it could only be the case if we are ourselves at the absolute summit of cognition, which just defies yeah. common sense. Yeah. And we, uh, but we just know that's not true. I mean, we just, just know it's not true. Just yeah. take you know, the calculator in your phone. I mean, it's, it, that's not human level. That is that is omniscient with respect to arithmetic. Yeah. You know, and you know, just having the, the totality of human knowledge instantaneously accessible through the internet. I mean, if we hook these things to the internet, it has a memory that is superhuman and yeah. a, um, an ability to integrate uh, data that is superhuman. So the moment all of these piecemeal cognitive skills cohere in a system that is also able to parse la- natural language perfectly, yeah. You, know, that you, you can talk to it and it understands. It does what you want. It all, the, all of the answers to the questions are no longer like series answers where they contain, you know, howlers, you know, every third trial, but they're the most perceptive, best informed, most articulate answers you're getting from any mind you ever interact with, right? Once those gains are made, they won't be unmade. It's like chess. It's like once computers were better at chess than people. Yeah. You know, and now we're in this this sort of no man's land, which again, which I, I think will be fairly brief, where the, the centaur. Co- yeah, the combination of a person and a and a computer is now the best system. But at a certain point, and I'm amazed that anyone doubts this, but at a certain point, I think it, it will obviously be the case that adding the ape to the equation just adds noise to the equation, and and you know the computers will be will be better than than cyborgs. And once they are, there's no go, going back from that point. It may not be everything. It may, it may there may be things we neglect to build into our AIs that are, turn out to be important for you know human common sense. Or I mean, this is this is the scary thing. We don't know what is required to fully align an intelligent system with our well-being, you know, and and so uh, we could neglect to put something like our common sense because we would don't perfectly understand it into these systems, and then you can get errors that are deeply counterintuitive. That, mm-hmm. are, that are I mean, this is analogous to you know Nick Bostrom's cartoon thought experiment of the the paperclips, the paperclip maximizer. Yeah. I mean, like, well, who would build such a machine? Well, we wouldn't, but we could build a machine that in the service of some goal that was is obviously a good one could form some instrumental goal that we would never think an intelligent system could form and that we would never think to explicitly prevent yeah and yet this thing is totally antithetical yeah, to, it, re- to, it reaches some everything local good. equilibrium where it says more paper clips good yeah I'm gonna do that for a while yeah and soon the universe is paper clips well, Sam, you have been um, extravagantly generous with your time. I appreciate well, not, it. Not immensely. at all. It's a pleasure. 